Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about snails and slugs, and we'd like to thank Danny B. for liking and sharing the podcast. We'd also like to thank everyone who sent us some nice emails about our new book. It's called Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Book 8, and you can download it on Amazon to any smart device. And it's only a dollar. And we spoke to Mike from Fluid Master, and he has some toilet tank repair tips. Researchers think that the brown garden snail was brought into the U.S. in the 1850s from France as a food source. Hmm. Historians have found archaeological evidence of people roasting snails about 10,000 years ago. And around 2,000 years ago, Romans had snail farms, and they would selectively breed snails for the best flavor. And Pliny the Elder, the Here Roman the, <laughs> the Roman historian, mm-hmm. he wrote about snail farms. He what s- didn't he write about? Yeah, he was pretty interesting. Not a lot of it was real accurate, but, <laughs> but he's got some interesting stuff. He said snails were fattened up with corn flour and herbs and then purged on milk for a few days before they were eaten. What do you mean purged? So they would either starve them or they would feed them a restricted diet to improve their flavor and get rid of any toxins. That's not what purge means. <laughs> That's what Pliny the Elder thinks purge means. Hmm. When I was doing some research on slug and snail control, one gardener said he goes out every night and collects the snails that are on his lettuce, and he eats them. That's, that's his pest control. Have you ever had a snail? No, no. And not no all... escargot for you? <laughs> no. And they're not all edible, but if snails in your garden are edible, you can eat them. But you have to be concerned if your neighbors are using any pest control because the snails could be ingesting that. Mm. That's why you should be purging them. (laughs) They can also carry parasitic diseases. Snails that ingest food or water with parasitic worms can infect people who eat raw or undercooked snails. The worms will work their way to your brain, then burrow into your brain, causing headaches, vomiting, and fatigue. In most people, the symptoms will disappear in a few weeks. But the worms could potentially cause brain damage. Hmm. There was a 19-year-old who ate a raw slug on a dare. He developed a brain infection, fell into a coma for 420 days, and the infection damaged his brain, causing him to lose control of his arms and legs. Hmm, Terrible. Yeah, amazing. The CDC says don't eat raw or undercooked snails or slugs. Because it's gross. (laughs) And the Hawaii Department of Health recommends eliminating snails and slugs from your garden and near your home. A report said they found snails and slugs will hide in a garden hose during the day and potentially contaminate the hose. They recommend not letting your kids or anyone drink out of a garden hose that's been left outside on the ground. Why would you drink out of a garden hose left outside on the ground? (laughs) Because it's convenient. Mm. You don't have to run anywhere for water. Snails and slugs are mollusks, and they're related to clams, squids, and octopuses. Slugs kind of look like a wide worm with eye stalks. They what can are eye stalks? So there's an eye on the end of this tentacle. It's, it's very alien looking. <laughs> and those eye stalks can also be used to smell, and they'll grow back if they're cut off. Weird. They also have two lower tentacles for feeling and tasting, They don't have ears, so they can't hear, but scientists think they can sense vibrations. And they eat with a tongue-like organ that's covered with rows of teeth, and they use it like a rasp to saw through your garden plants to eat. It is like an alien. (laughs) It's pretty wild. Snails are like slugs, but they have a shell they're attached to, and they can go into it for protection from predators and to keep them from drying out. Slugs and snails move around by flexing the muscle along the bottom of their body, and they produce a slime or mucus that helps them slide over surfaces. Gross. The sli- <laughs> that slime also helps prevent their body from drying out, and they're generally hiding during the day to keep out of the sun. They're going to be most active at night and on cloudy days. In cold climates, garden snails and slugs will burrow into the soil and hibernate. In hot climates, they'll hibernate during hot, dry periods in cool, damp areas. 
and many garden snails and slugs are gray in color, but they can be yellow to black, and most have both male and female reproductive organs. Hmm. So in the right conditions, you can have a population explosion in your garden. Exciting. Garden slugs are usually around an inch long. A garden snail could have a shell around an inch high and one to one and a half inches wide. And there's quite a variety of colors and patterns on their shells. And the shells actually grow with the snail. They keep adding to the outside edge so it gets longer and wider. Britain has the world's largest slug. It gets about 12 inches long. Hmm. Garden snails and slugs, they'll eat lettuce, peppers, strawberries, spinach, basil, dill, cucumbers, along with most small green plants in your garden. They'll also eat flowers in your landscape areas, and they're great climbers. They can go up trees and bushes. Mm. I saw a couple pictures online of trees filled with snails. They're all over the bark, and they can strip the bark off young trees. They're actually very good at climbing, so they can go up the side of your raised garden bed, which is pretty crazy. I, I would never imagine that slugs and snails would be good climbers. Why? They don't have feet. But they have feet. <laughs> if you have a snail problem in your garden, the first thing to do is eliminate any good hiding spots. You should move firewood away from the garden and store it off the ground. Check to see if they're hiding under any stones, the underside of decks, the bottom of horizontal wood on fences, along the bottom of raised flower and garden beds. Check under wood or plant debris around your garden. They can burrow under pots and ground cover. They're looking for dark, damp areas to rest during the day. The mucus they secrete will sometimes leave a trail that you can follow to find their hiding spot. And the cosmetic industry uses snail slime for some skincare products. And you can go to a snail spa and have a bunch of snails crawl around your face, and the slime they leave behind is supposed to reduce wrinkles. Not going to happen. <laughs> to reduce snails and slugs, pick plants that they don't prefer. Gardeners say they don't like highly scented plants like rosemary, begonias, sage, catmint plants, and mint, or plants with fuzzy or hairy leaves. You should water your garden and landscape areas early and let them dry out at night, Slugs and snails want to hide in damp areas, and they want to lay their eggs in damp material. Gardeners say drip irrigation focused on watering just your plants rather than sprinklers will help reduce slugs and snails also. Hmm. If you're thinking about adding a water feature to your landscaping, you should fill it with lizards, toads, frogs, and encourage birds. They love to eat slugs and snails. Lizards? You, yeah, add a gecko, maybe some iguanas. To your backyard? Right. <laughs> How are you going to keep them in your backyard? I loved my iguana when I was a kid. And my iguana liked my mom better. Whenever my mom would go past my bedroom, it would bob its head and blow out its dewlap. <laughs> you can also create a barrier around small gardens or raised garden beds with chopped mint and wool. Gardeners say mint seems to repel them, and they don't seem to like the texture of wool. There's a product called Slug Gone. It's S-L-U-G, capital G-O-N-E. It's pellets made from natural wool. You put it down as a barrier, and then you water it. It swells up, and it makes a surface that snails and slugs hate to crawl on. <laughs> Keep space between your plants for good air circulation, and pull back mulch from around the base of your plants. You can use mint or diatomaceous earth as a border control. Diatomaceous earth is the fossilized remains of microscopic algae. It's a safe insect killer, and it works like a sponge, removing the thin protective wax covering on insects, and the sharp edges cut into the coating, helping dry out insects. It's non-toxic, safe to use around people and pets, but you don't want to breathe it in. Whenever you're applying it, you should wear a dust mask. Penn State University says diatomaceous earth will irritate and dry out the protective layer of fats and oils on slugs and snails, and the sharp structure of the powder can be a deterrent. Hmm. Gardeners say you don't want to overdo the application of diatomaceous earth in your garden. There's a lot of beneficial bugs you don't want to kill. It's not effective when it's wet, and you're going to have to reapply it over time. Look for food-grade diatomaceous earth, not diatomaceous earth for pool filters. That diatomaceous earth is heat-treated and can have chemicals added. 
Some top-rated diatomaceous earth is from Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. Theirs is food grade and O-M-R-I listed. Safer, S-A-F-E-R. They have insect rated. And diatomaceousearth.com. They have food grade that's designed for human consumption. There's supposed to be a variety of health benefits if you eat diatomaceous earth. So you're going to spell safer in Harris, but you're not going to spell diatomaceous? <laughs> D I A T O M A S E O U S and then Earth E A R T H a dot and a com. <laughs> Some gardeners say use crushed eggshells as a barrier, but a study done by the North Dakota State University says it doesn't work. Hmm. Many gardeners say hand picking snails and slugs from your garden daily may be all you need to do if you don't have a large population. You can set out a few overturned pots around your garden and water that area well, and that will attract them. You can use the rinds of melons overturned on the ground. The snails and slugs will feed on it and then hide under this during the day, and it really makes a good trap. All you have to do is turn them over, and they'll be covered on that rind. Gross. You can also set out short boards on the ground and keep them just off the surface with twigs or stones. They'll hide under that. And then some gardeners will take them, crush them up, and use them as fertilizer back into the garden, or they'll add them to a compost pile. Hmm. Gardeners say beer attracts snails and slugs, so bury a pie plate, a small bucket, a soup can, or a cup with the top edge even with the soil surface, and then any snails or slugs falling into the beer, they're usually going to drown, and then you can add that to a compost pile or throw them out. And you should be checking this once a day or once every couple of days. Is beer good for your compost pile? Absolutely. Nothing better. (laughs) You don't want to use salt to kill slugs and snails. It will damage your plants, the soil, and microorganisms in the soil. You sounded kind of sad about that. (laughs) There are slug and snail baits. I would check the chemicals when I'm comparing. Many use metaldehyde or methiocarb. Both are toxic and not approved for organic gardening, and they've been trying to ban metaldehyde in the UK, saying it's bad for the environment. They're both dangerous for people and pets. Some formulations add other chemicals that will kill earthworms and other beneficial insects. Slug and snail baits that use iron phosphate or ferric sodium EDTA are considered much safer. They're less toxic to dogs and cats, and they're using iron to kill the slugs and snails. Some top-rated companies with snail bait, Safer, S-A-F-E-R, Cory's, C-O-R-R-Y-S, and Garden Safe. Many gardeners say copper strips put around the outside of a raised garden bed or around the base of a tree will prevent slugs and snails from going over it. Where are you getting copper strips? So a lot of garden centers or hardware stores will have copper strips for slugs and snails. It's like a thing. (laughs) The Oregon State University said use strips that are wider than their body. They say in tests, copper irritates their body, and Mm. so they tend to back away from it. For raised garden beds, you can also create an electric fence just using a 9-volt battery and metal wire. You connect the end of the metal wire to one of the terminals, wrap it around your raised bed, leave a little space between the wire, connect the other end to the other terminal, and then when the snail or the slug goes over that first wire, and then it touches the other wire, it gets a shock, and then it goes the other direction. Does it kill them? No, it just gives them a shock. And and I watched a couple of videos. Sometimes they'll touch it once or twice, but every time, or at least of the videos I saw. They all went the other direction after a couple of shocks. I spoke to Mike from Fluid Master, and he has some toilet repair tips. Mike, how you doing? Oh, good. If a homeowner's replacing a toilet fill valve, what do they need to know before purchasing a new one? Well, it's really good if they know a little bit about their toilet and how it operates before they go out and buy one. For example, three key things that we like to ask our customers are, do you know how old your toilet is? That will give us a gallon per flush reference on what they should use. Do they have a special type of flushing system? Is it a flapper or a canister? Or maybe there's something stamped. A lot of toilets today have stamped inside 1.6 gallon per flush, 1.28. 
So being able to look at these three basic ideas or things, that should allow you to know what you need to get. And what are the different types of fill valves if I walk into a hardware store? Well, there are a lot of different types of fill valves out there. I think Fluid Master's done a really great job with their selection because we basically have two. We've got our Performax fill valve, which is our high efficiency valve, and our Universal 400A, which everybody seems to know. What's really great about the two is that the 400A is a standard fill valve, which will work on most 1.6 and larger gallon per flush. In, in layman terms, if your toilet's from 2000, 2001, all the way back to 1940, there's a good chance the 400A is going to fit and work fine. Okay. If you have anything after that date, 2001, 2004, and you have something called high efficiency or you see a stamping that says 1.28 or you have a, a non-flapper valve, it's a big canister valve or something that's really strange, then these are what we call high efficiency toilets and the Performax is the valve that we would recommend. And what's the unique thing about the Performax? The unique thing about the Performax and what makes it different than the 400A, fill valves actually fill not only the tank but the toilet bowl. And here's the key. A Performax fill valve puts more water into the toilet bowl. It comes down to a timing issue. We have to make sure that because we're filling the tank faster, we need to put more water faster into the bowl to get it to the highest level. The main thing we're looking to do is get the water in the bowl to the top of the trap for the best flushing? That is correct. When the bowl is not filled up to its optimum level, let's say it's lower than that. Let's say you put a 400A or a ball cock in a high-efficiency toilet. The ball cock will go ahead and fill the tank up, but because the flushing system closes down so soon, you won't have enough water in the bowl. Not enough water in the bowl can lead to two big problems. One, you have to sit there and flush a couple of times to get everything out of it. And two, it could actually let sewer gas into the home and permeate the walls, which is not a good thing. Wow, interesting. So if I were replacing a fill valve and I didn't know how many gallons per flush, is there anything I can do to figure that out? Or if I get the Performax, is it kind of goof-proof? Actually, the 400H, which is the Performax fill valve, is kind of foolproof. Okay. Well, the way we've designed it is that it's set up to refill the toilet bowl just like the 400A, so it's foolproof. However, it's got a little knob adjustment so that if you need more water to the bowl more quickly, you can just twist a little knob, and that will increase the water to the bowl. So the Performax 400H is really a foolproof system. But to really answer your question, the only way to know if there's no marking on the tank it's not stamped anywhere. You're looking at this. Guess at the toilet's age. There are three key ages, 1985, 1994, and roughly 2005. The 85 metric, it means that you have the first original water-saving toilets, which is a 3.5 gallon per flush. The 400A is great for that. Okay. After 1994, it went to 1.6 gallons per flush. Again, to about 2005, that's really great for the 400A. It's still a standard refill toilet. Anything after 2005, and there are some exceptions, the gallons per flush actually get less. We see more 1.28s. We're seeing a lot more dual flush systems. We're seeing a lot more alternating flushing systems that require more water to the bowl, and that's where the Performax comes in. So let's say I don't have any idea. I just moved into a new home, just purchased a new home, and my toilet's not filling properly. I'm going to change the fill valve. If I get the Performax 400H, what's the key things I need to do to have enough water in the tank and the bowl? I think the key thing is the primary adjustment. The Fluid Master H, it has three primary adjustments. It's got the height adjustment, so you can actually lengthen it to conform to the height of the tank so you get enough water okay okay you have a secondary adjustment which is allowing you to raise or lower the water in the tank so that you can have it to the water line that's stated or to some place below the overflow pipe okay. 
And then you've got the third adjustment, which is the bowl adjustment, which can raise and lower the water in the bowl. So it's kind of foolproof. Mike, if I wanted to replace the flapper inside the tank, or if I have a canister-style flush valve, what would I need to know? First off, a flapper valve and a canister uh, flush valve, they do the same thing, but they're very different. And there are two different connection points. So the first thing you have to decide is look in your toilet and do you have a canister versus a flapper? That's the first thing. A flapper will replace a flapper valve, but a canister valve can only be replaced by a canister valve in most cases. And with a canister, we're talking about a rubber gasket, a seal? A canister usually is a tower. Maybe that's a better way to describe it. It's usually a long plastic tower that comes up and comes down to release the water, which is connected either by a tank lever or a cable assembly or something like that. And in that case, with a canister, I'm replacing a circular seal rather than a flap. That's correct. Most canisters will have a flat seal at the bottom of the canister where it meets the ceramic tank. And a lot of times, the canister will just pull straight out of the tank very easily without having to remove the tank and then just peel off the seal and replace it. And how would I decide what I need? That's very specific. Most canister valves are are going to be by certain manufacturers. Kohler has one, for example, their Aqua Piston. Mansfield is very popular with their 2 and 3 inch Mansfield canisters. And uh, I believe American Standard at one time had one called the Champion 3 that was a canister. The new Glacier Bays from Home Depot, all are canister valves. And so you would have to be very specific to the company that you're dealing with. So if you have a Kohler, you stick with Kohler. If you have a a Glacier Bay, then you stick with Glacier Bay, which is kind of nice because Fluid Master now has certain canister seals that will work in a lot of these products so that you don't have to go to Kohler or go to American Standard or go to Glacier Bay. You can come to Fluid Master, get them from your favorite retailers, and you should be able to pick the seal of your choice. And I would just bring that into the hardware store? That's what we tell a lot of customers. A lot of customers are seeing this for the first time. Like I said before, you know, most people don't know anything about their toilet until it breaks, and then they're looking at it, you know, oh, my God, what do I get? (laughs) So what we tell them is, look, if, if you can't snap a photo of it and send it to us, you know, or describe it over the phone, take it off, bring it into the store, and let your local hardware expert help you out with that. And with the flapper style, there's different sizes now? Yes. Flappers have gotten a little bit more complicated with the advent of these large 3-inch or larger flappers. A myriad of different manufacturers, including American Standard, again, Glacier Bay, Kohler, and Toto, all have these larger 3-inch flapper systems, which um, are high efficiency. They let more water into the bowl. Uh, They get to use less water, even though they're putting more water at the same time into the bowl. So, yes, bringing the flapper and knowing what it looks like and how big it is is very important. Let me make a a key distinction here. We talk about flappers being three inches uh, versus the original flapper from like the 1970s, even the early 1990s and 2000s being two inch. That confuses people because when you measure the flapper across, it'll measure three inches. Well, that's for a two-inch flush valve. And when you measure the three-inch flapper across, it's four inches. And that's for a three-inch flush valve. So it can get a little confusing, but those are the types of things that people need to come in, look at, and measure. If you're adjusting a flap, what does that mean? Adjusting a flapper allows you to control how much water leaves the tank. In the 1970s, early 1980s, you would get a flapper, and the flapper would come open, and it would stay open, and it would drain the whole tank. The geometry of the tank and the bowl, it it needed all that water to flush the bowl. Today, things are so much smaller. The geometry of the bowl is smaller. The tanks are smaller. And if you try to drain a whole tank in a 1.6 or a 1.28 gallon per flush, 
you'll notice that the bowl will fill up, flush out, fill up, flush out, and do that several times. We call that double flushing before the flapper closes. Adjustable flappers allow you to make the flapper close sooner so you're not using all the water in the tank. Interesting. I guess if you're looking at this as a, as a homeowner, you have one of these and you know you have a 1.6, how much water should be flushing out of your tank? Well, every manufacturer is going to tell you something a little different, but if you just use this trick, if you say, well, just about half the water in the tank should leave, and you just use that you know, as a barometer, you should be able to go ahead and get a good, powerful flush using the recommended amount for that particular toilet. If it's a 1.28, it's maybe one-fourth of the tank. Looking at, you know, what to use and how much to use, that's a really good way that I explain to my customers over the phone if they're using the right amount of water or not. Mike, you guys have a new tank lever called the Perfect Fit? Yes. And what's the unique thing about your tank lever? The tank lever for Perfect Fit has one really neat feature. Most people will go out and buy a tank lever and they'll put it on, but now a lot of people are having these right-handed tank levers. Champion from American Standard is a good example. I actually own one at home. And the tank lever is on the right. Well, if you ever bought a generic tank lever and then you got it home and the tank lever is supposed to be on the right, it's upside down and it doesn't work, okay? And you're like, what the heck, right? right. So Perfect Fit has actually figured out a way to remove the handle so it can go not only on the left-hand side but the right-hand side. That's great. The other neat thing is that the arm is, is canistered so it can move back and forth. So what this allows us to do is to angle the arm for those customers who have toilets on the corner that are kind of rounded. Instead of bending the arm, the arm will just move out. And even on the side of the tank where a lot of one-piece toilets or a lot of the higher price point toilets will have, a lot of people like that side tank lever. And the tank lever will then just move and allow you to fit it right into the side and still flush the flapper and bring it up and, and get you good flush. So very universal. Goes in just about any position. Mike, if we wanted to learn more about the Fluid Master products, where would we go? Well, the best place to go would be fluidmaster.com. Here we have a product page. You can select all the different products from all the different kits, the different combination of flappers and, and fill valves we put together for different projects that you might for want your toilet. Uh, what's really nice is we have a support page where you can actually ask questions, whether you submit an email or chat with one of my technicians and ask a quick question. We also have uh, product knowledge sheets or solutions where if you've got a problem, you can go in and you can take a look and see if, hey, you know what, oh, they have this problem, let's read this, it's got a solution for you. We're, we're currently got a lot of videos. I know that a lot of our younger homeowners out there really don't want to read through, you know, a big <laughs> book and why don't you figure this out? But, you know, we've got, you know, very fast, very short videos that are right to the point that show you how to install how to correct, how to troubleshoot. And, of course, you can always give us a call. We're here from 5.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, and I've got great technical service reps that are ready to take your questions. Well, I appreciate your time, Mike. Thank you. You're welcome, JC, and I hope you guys have a great afternoon. That was a great interview. Yeah, it's interesting, all the changes with the high-efficiency toilets, and you can get more tips on their website, fluidmaster.com. Do you have anything else to add? If you're having a problem with snails and slugs in your garden, you can start out hand-picking and setting up non-toxic traps. If you're shopping for bait, I would compare the chemicals, especially if you have kids or pets. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Himalaya, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our eBooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, books one through eight on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter. 
at Fix It Co host, and you can follow us on Instagram, Fix It Home Improvement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Do you be? 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 Do you be?